Hello, everybody. My name is Valerie Yi. I am the Chief of Staff of the Seller Experience Product and Technology Organization. Within our organization, we own the listing tools and the shipping, member-to-member -member communications, and the platform that charges the fees. And the intention is to make sure you get charged accurate fees. Uh, I have been at eBay for 18 plus years. I've been in the selling organization for two plus years. In my many roles here, I spent three years partnering with our customer support organization to address customer pain points across eBay. So I know a little bit about a lot of things. Uh, but today I'm going to go over the listing basics, things that I've learned as a seller and as an employee. This may be basic for some of you. I know Joe DeMarco's in here. He's been selling for years, uh, but hopefully you could all learn something new. But the thing I want to start with is that I'm not to my not my first slide yet. He's staying here, Stephanie. Uh, the thing I want to start with is first and foremost is that when I'm creating listings, I think like a buyer. And this is what I ask myself as I go through the listing tools. And as I do this, I'm gonna go through uh, some, point out some myths that we see in the community to help debunk them for you to share uh, when you're on other places as well. So next slide. So I'm gonna start with item title. Uh, I'm gonna, the, the screenshots are from the new listing tool, uh, which went fully live last late last year. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the listing tool in general, I'm gonna talk about listing basics. So uh, as it comes for item titles, just be careful of keyword stuff in your title. We see listings, for example, out of both Android and iPhone. Uh, this can just be confusing for the buyer and also for the eBay search engine. So I always like to say, stick to the facts check. Uh, also, the order of the words in the title is always a big debate. So someone in, you know, search ranking team provided some guidance to me that the title should be written as if you're saying it to someone. So you likely wouldn't say loft, plaid, blouse, women's size, medium, black, white, red, long sleeve, polyester. But rather, you might want to say to your friend, Ann Taylor, loft, long sleeve, blouse, size, medium, black, white, and red plaid. Uh, I know it's tricky, you've got a character limit, but you know you don't need to put the item condition in the title because it's shown right underneath the title in search and on view item and also in the saved as they're on your My eBay as well. So you can save those characters for accurately describing your item. And side comment is NWT is not really an industry standard term. So like new buyers don't necessarily don't necessarily know what that means. So again, you can save those characters for other things. Emoticons, big debate on this as well. So they don't help a buyer make a purchase decision. So I would suggest to use those title characters to help describe the item instead. Uh, I've seen myths online about apostrophe. So someone said, hey, for example, 1940s in the title, does that, that if you put the apostrophe, that it negatively affects you in the search algorithm. So what's the verdict uh, with or without the apostrophe? Inquiring minds wanna know. So I consulted our search team and they said that 1940s shirt with no apostrophe and 1940s shirt with the apostrophe both get tokenized into 1940 space S space shirt. So in other words, it has zero effect on search ranking or the algorithm. They are the same. So please don't spend time worrying about punctuation. On the back end, it's all taken care of and it all appears the same. So uh, I know that's always been a big myth going around in the world, so don't worry about it. Uh, we do try to extract the item specifics from the title. I know this can be tricky. Pink is a Victoria's Secret brand. It's also a color, it's also a person. So you know, bear with us, the machines aren't as smart as we all are as humans. And so we try to make it as, as best we can. There are abilities to say, select all from the title or not. So you can choose your choice. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, one real thing, one quick, quick thing I learned recently was that when we talk about item, actually, no, I have item specifics. I'll get there in a second. Next, next slide. Item specifics, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so let's just be clear. Required is required. That's it. They are created with the intention of buyer demand. This is what a majority of the buyers are filtering and searching for. If you choose to add the additional item specifics, we provide data to help you make an informed decision. So we will have in there like how often a, a buyer searches for that item specific and it's your choice. Um, use it or don't use it. 
it is perfectly okay to, to leave all the additional and recommended blank. Honestly, I swear to God, I swear, I swear. So, you know, you make that decision, it's up to you of how you want to spend your time. Um, you know, it's okay to, to ignore the little ad recommended little red bubble. I know we all get a little obsessive about the red bubble. Um, just, it's okay. You don't have to worry about it. I know we added like the little circle to close it with a lightning bolt back in the day. And we all got super obsessive about closing the circle. It's okay not to close the circle. It's okay not to complete all things. It's okay to have the bubble that says, you know, we have recommended item specifics to add. Uh, I know it's really annoying in Seller Hub. You can address them one by one. I hope we can do that by bulk someday, but just keep that in mind. Required is required, and that's all you need. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out. Please don't use NA. Uh, I know people say, I want to put NA, but just keep that in mind of where that goes. It shows up on the left-hand navigation in search as a buyer. So if you're a buyer, when you, when's the last time you were shopping online and you wanted to filter your results on NA? No buyer is going to filter on that. Don't waste the time. Don't do it. Just leave it blank. And so the other thing I hear a lot is like, what if nothing's on the list that what's what I want? Like, like there's something on there's like, I want to add my own. I also don't recommend adding your own unless something's totally like missing and broken. Um, and if something is missing or broken, use the three dots at the very top of the listing tool to give us exact feedback of the category you're in and the item specific that's wrong or missing. And we can then add that into the system on the back end. Um, but if you add that in, it usually won't appear on the left-hand navigation anyway, because there's just not enough buyer demand data for that item. And so let us know if it's missing, but you know, for the most part, it's okay, just leave them blank. The other thing I always beg, beg people is it, don't guess. If you don't know what the item of that thing is asking for, just don't guess. I was recently selling a coach wristlet and it was asking for the material of the strap. I didn't know what it was. I don't know if it's leather, I don't know if it's a pleather, I don't know what it is, but I don't wanna guess because I don't wanna have a disappointed buyer and open myself up for an item not described case. So. If you don't know what it is, it's just leave it blank. So the last thing I want to comment on is the relationship between category and item specifics. They are tightly coupled, which is why when we do our seller updates, that's why all the categories change and the item specifics go with it. And it's super complex and frustrating. We totally get that, but they are very tightly coupled. So if you fill out item specifics first and then you change your category, it likely will data will all reset. And I know a lot of people say it's a glitch. It's actually not. It's actually because each category has their own buyer demand data for which the item specifics are required or additional. So if you are going to be changing your category, change your category first and then fill out your item specifics. It's just sort of a recommendation. Next slide. We're going to talk about photos. Uh, my constant reminder is think like a buyer. Buyers like pictures. Uh, my mantra that I use is I take pictures as if there's no description and I write the description as if there's no pictures. So remember, we do have users who are visually impaired. Keep those in mind. And also many sellers say buyers don't read. Uh, so, you know, use more pictures. If you haven't noticed late last year, we now offer 24 pictures for free. Uh, so definitely use those as much as you want. But don't add multiple pictures of the same thing. Like, don't think you need to add 24 pictures to game search or something like that. If you're literally have a new in box product and the front and the back is all you need, that's okay. So don't think like you have to use 24. I've seen sellers put the same picture over and over and over again. Again, think like a buyer. As a buyer, I'm like, why are you showing me the same thing? Like, is there a flaw I'm not seeing? Like, why is this picture different than that picture? So just keep those things in mind. Um, I'm going to go on to the background debate. So I know you all want to stand out. You want to use the fancy Instagram wood grain backdrop. Uh, the good news is that Google now accepts non-white backgrounds. I know we're pushing for that for years and years, saying it has to be white if Google takes it as part of Google Shopping. They drop that requirement, which is great. But this doesn't help answer your burning question, I know, of the white background or not. So again, I go back to think like a buyer philosophy. Ultimately, your goal is to sell items, so you will have to make the judgment call on what works best for your inventory. But I do suggest avoiding the graffiti and the watermarks because that does not showcase the item that you're selling. So just think like a buyer, like what if you were going to buy this item would those pictures showcase your item? If it looks better on a wood grain background and it makes it look fancy, feel free. Um, also, new last year was the ability to add videos to your listing and also to your storefront. 
Uh, I've heard sellers say like, why do I need a video? Um, I'm not sure if you all noticed, but there's that popular app called TikTok and a lot of people like videos. So um, you may be missing out on the next generation of buyers. I know my kids on Instagram all day long, but uh, you know, it's, I know some people say, well, my video, my thing doesn't move. And I'm like, that's fine. But sometimes just doing a 360 of your item builds buyers trust and they know that that's the item they're gonna get. Next slide. I'm gonna get into pricing. Pricing is a touchy subject. We don't know your margins. You're in control of your business, of what you want to charge for your inventory. But, you know, it's also a marketplace. Auction. Everyone's like, auction, fixed price. What do I do? I, you know, I wouldn't use auction, me personally. You know, not talking about, like, commodity items. Like, you know, this is better when you don't know the market price. For example, like, no one wants to wait five days to buy a puzzle. Like, if I'm looking at a puzzle, if my kid wants his puzzle, I'm not going to wait five days for an auction to end. So just sort of keep that in mind of, like, again, like the buyer. Like, is a buyer going to wait five days for a puzzle? Maybe, maybe not. If it's a hot puzzle and you don't know the price of it, sure. But if it's something I can buy as a commodity thing, probably better to do buy it now. Now, when it comes to reserve price, just keep in mind that many new sellers get burned by the fact that the insertion fee gets charged even if the item doesn't sell. So buyers prefer transparency um, and just sort of keep that in mind um, that that is what the, the set your price for the item. Sorry, set the price at what you're willing to sell it for. So this is for auctions specifically. If you're going to sell it, if you're willing to sell it for $90, start at $90. Like don't mess around with the reserve price. Um, for a fixed price, we added into the listing tools the sold data, the sold listing data for the past 30 days. There's charts and graphs and all kinds of fun things to see. Um, definitely use sold listings. The uh, has 90 day sold items in there. If you get into Terapeak formally, there's two years of data in there. Um, just to be clear, like the market changes. So like I was selling these Harry Potter Lego sets years ago, selling like hotcakes for $9.99, $9.99, mind you. And right around Christmas, great stocking stuffer. January, sales stop. Like, what happened? Well, the market price literally dropped to $5. And I was way overpriced. So keep that in mind. People ask about slow sales. And sometimes the market changes around you. A lot of times you hear, well, I didn't change anything. Something, something went wrong. It's like, well, yes, you didn't change anything, but the market did. And so you have to be aware of what the market as a whole is doing, because that can also affect your sales as well. Next slide, please. We're going to get into shipping. The headline says it all. We all know shipping isn't free, and we know the prices keep going up. So totally get it. I'm going to go basic here about shipping in general. But like shipping seems super complicated for new sellers. If you are a seasoned seller, I know you're on the Facebook groups. You're seeing all of it. Um, but ultimately, it really comes down to three things. Package weight, dimensions, and who will deliver it, right? For package weight, the key is knowing how much the item weighs when it's packed. Big hint, we all know cardboard weighs way more than you think it does. Um, what are the dimensions of it, of the package or the poly mill you're using? And then choosing a carrier, like who's gonna put it on their porch, right? Like, And I know the, the shipping seems super complicated, but it really comes down to, to those three things. And like new sellers, I don't know how many new sellers out there, but like ultimately I suggest to start with like small things. Like I've sold way over a thousand things on the site. And my brother gave me a hockey stick to sell. And I'm like, even I'm intimidated by that. I was like, oh my God, how the heck am I going to ship this thing? So start small, like just kind of get your feet wet, get going. As a new seller, I highly recommend using calculated shipping at first, help you get the hang of it and not lose money. Uh, like I said, shipping costs more than you think it does. Like I sold a four ounce item last weekend and it was $4.44 to ship it to Florida. Now granted, I'm in California, but like, it's like, holy cow, the thing was $17. I did free shipping because I've been selling for a while. But yeah, I mean, it really does like eat into your margin. So like highly recommend start off with calculated shipping, kind of get your feet wet and figure it out. Um, but last thing we'll talk about the free shipping debate. Everyone's like, oh, this, how do I, you know, I want a game search from top of search. I need to offer free shipping. Not necessarily. Um, there's free shipping versus total cost in search there are buyers who will filter on free shipping. Like that is a button they can click in search. And that's true. If a buyer clicks that and you don't offer free shipping, you disappear from that search result. Just it's the way it works. Um, and so you may lose out on some visibility 
uh, or some sales from buyers who literally filter the results on free shipping. Uh, but the safer way is the get your feet wet is definitely start with calculated shipping. But like if you do play with the, the ship, the free shipping area, um, there's actually times I've seen the total cost is more expensive with free shipping without it. But because the buyer filters on free shipping, they're actually not seeing the cheaper item. So not suggesting you do that, but it's, it is an interesting nuance is that you are potentially missing out on buyers if they if they choose to filter on that. Next slide. And my final one. So just to recap, title, I always like to say, write the titles if you're saying it to someone. Item specifics, only the required or required. Photos, take pictures if there's no description. Write the description as if there's no pictures. Pricing, use the sold data to help make an informed decision. And then shipping, I'm encouraging new sellers to start with calculated shipping. So that's all I have. And I have had the chat covered up while I was talking because I didn't want to get distracted. So I apologize if you all have tons of questions and things that you're like, how come you didn't answer that question? Because I Then Valerie, we're going to move on to Susan's presentation and do Q&A at the end. Just Perfect. to get everyone's right. presentation. I will try to Susan. answer questions in chat. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Susan, if you want to come off camera. Yes, thank you so much, Valerie and Stephanie. Um, glad to be here. Wish I could see everyone's faces. Um, so I will be talking about how to manage angry buyers and still deliver. Um, so once again, my name is Susan Bragg, and I'm currently a growth advisor. I specialize in helping sellers optimize their business, which means I consult with sellers daily and help with all things sell. So let's talk about managing angry buyers. Um, when eBay looked for someone um, with some experience to reach out to to help um, speak to this, um, they looked to me, I think because I've had over 10 years of experience working eBay's customer service phone queues. So I think I'm a good candidate to talk about angry customers. Um, speaking with customers via the phone is a bit different than through eBay's member-to-member -member messaging, but there are a lot of principles and tips and um, some tricks I can give you that definitely hold true in both cases. So I'd like to share with you some things that I learned over those 10 years of working on the phones. First off is um, an ounce of prevention. So it's important to mention briefly that uh, once again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure on eBay as well. What that means for us on the platform is we need to give buyers all of the information that they need to know about an item in the title, the item specifics, the description, the photos and videos if possible. Remember to ensure that you're also listing in the proper categories. Note that eBay uses those titles and item specifics to match your items to buyer searches. So ensuring that those are spot on will help eBay to show the correct items for the correct buyers up front. Um, also offer returns so that buyers feel that if something does go wrong, they can work with you. Knowing that they can return items builds trust up front and can often prevent frustration down the line. And also don't forget to package items well to ensure that they don't get damaged. So let's say something went wrong. You've done all of what we just talked about. What's next? So we are going to talk about the three P's to a response. Be professional. Don't take it personally and take time to pause. First and foremost, be professional. So this seems to go without saying, but over the last 11 plus years of working for eBay, I can say that I've seen many unprofessional responses to buyers, even from well-intentioned, well-seasoned sellers. It can be really easy to get sucked into someone else's anger, especially if they're being unprofessional. But we as sellers have to remain on high ground. Don't let their anger turn into your anger. It's difficult to help someone when that's happened. Secondly, don't take it personally. Usually the customer isn't upset with you, but the situation that they find themselves in, even if it's not your fault, it is your responsibility to address their complaints and to try and resolve the problem. 
And thirdly, take time to pause. Remain calm. It's helpful to focus on the information that the buyer is sharing rather than how they are sharing it. The nice thing about eBay buyers is that they contact you electronically, which gives you time to pause and assess before reacting. Take that time. Keeping in mind the timeliness of your response though, still take a few moments, take a few breaths before composing a reply. Then reread your reply before hitting the send button and ensure that you are responding the way you would hope to be responded to. Next slide. So I'd like to talk about the elements that make up a response. I like to think that there are three possible parts to a customer reply an element where you show sympathy and concern, um, an informational part, and a solution. So firstly, be sympathetic, be apologetic, and be genuine. Apologizing doesn't mean accepting blame, but rather lets the customer feel that you've heard their concern and are empathetic to their situation. Your tone will come through in your message. Sometimes a buyer's anger is rooted in other unseen circumstances. We may feel their anger isn't justified, but it's helpful to take pause and realize there may be or may have been other dominoes outside of this situation that were knocked down and now they're at their wit's end. Have empathy for their situation. Empathy can frequently diffuse anger. Be specific in your apology. That tends to calm situations and angry customers. The opposite of that would be a generic, I'm sorry, which can feel disingenuous and can add fuel to the fire. I definitely experienced that when an angry customer at eBay had felt that I wasn't being sincere. Um, things escalated fast and I quickly learned that being genuine and communicating that was crucial, crucial to helping someone who's angry. Um, people get angry when they lose time, money, and trust. We can't get their time back. We may be able to get their money back, but we can most likely win their trust back. When you are specific with your apology and response, the customer will feel that you fully understand the implications of their issue and they're going to feel heard. You can start with phrases like, I'm so sorry, if this had happened to me, I would feel the same, or I understand why you're upset, or I understand why this is important to you. Then you can build on those phrases with specifics to the situation. Sometimes we have to decipher why they're angry. We may need to read between the lines, especially to understand the root feelings behind their anger. If an item arrives late, for example, the root cause of the anger may be that they didn't have a gift for someone or they missed being able to use that item for a special occasion. If it's a difficult item to replace that they had been looking for for a long time and the item's been damaged or lost, they may be angry at the thought of not finding another. Secondly, offer an explanation. If it makes sense to the concern or at least that it matters, knowing the why can sometimes um, calm a buyer's anger. Sometimes buyers are unaware of surrounding situations that are affecting the transaction. During the winter, for example, there can be storms in areas of the country that affect delivery times. Researching why something happened can give buyers insights that they may not have seen themselves. This also shows that you're taking time to address their concern. And lastly, offer a solution. At the end of the day, this is usually what people are looking for. When customers are angry on top of wanting to feel heard, they're looking for a solution. Offer and return often makes sense, but sometimes there are other solutions. If you're not sure what a customer is looking for, simply ask. How can I resolve this for you? Or how can I make this right for you? Sometimes what we think is a good solution isn't what the customer is looking for or isn't something that we can make happen. Next slide. When something goes wrong, it could be an opportunity to really deliver to win a customer in a big way. If we can turn a situation around and make an angry customer a delighted one, we've really made an impact and probably a repeat customer. Next slide. 
And lastly, remember that we protect sellers too. You may have to deal with angry buyers, but you do not have to deal with abusive ones. Report, report buyers that are abusing the system or are inappropriate in their messages to you. Conversations are recorded via the member to member messaging system. So buyers may not demand something that isn't offered in the original listing. Make false claims, uh, such as saying something wasn't received when tracking shows delivered. Misuse returns, misuse eBay messaging or bidding, or abuse eBay's buyer protection programs or your payment service provider's dispute processes. Use the report a buyer feature found in help and contact when necessary. And if it comes down to it, you can also add buyers to your block bidder buyer list. And finally, don't rule out that if you ever need help managing a buyer or situation, our customer service representatives can be a, be a valuable resource. A quick chat to seek advice or get a second opinion may be useful. I hope you've picked up some tips and tricks along the way and thanks so much for listening.